Thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Mick Bencourt, class of 1992, the last class of uh, all male and all male <clears throat> Fenwick High School. It's just amazing to see the powerful, amazing women that are here that have elevated uh, and taken Fenwick to the next level. When I was here, it was just uh, all boys, and it was just a bunch of stinky dudes wandering around the wall <laughs> with messed up hair. <laughs> now we have all these mirrors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even think this room was here when I was here. What is this? What's this? Um, it's predominantly used by the palms. Oh, they cool. use it as their rehearsal space. That's the palms thing. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, for people who like purple. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> this is, uh, I've been downloaded a little bit about the class and what everybody's been up to, and I truly am honored to be here, and it's an honor for me to come back to Fenwick. I, uh, <clears throat> like I said, I was in class in 1992. <clears throat> I'll give you a little kind of... Um, a snapshot of who I am and most importantly the impact that Fenwick has had on me uh, just as a human being and as an artist. So from my seventh grade summer, from June of my seventh grade summer until November of my freshman year here at Fenwick, I had no parents. I was uh, living with my grandfather in Berlin on 25th and Clarence down the block from the Tasty Freeze and he had a heart attack and he passed away and no one claimed me. My mother was living downstairs, but she was struggling with some alcoholism and some drug addiction. And so she kind of moved out and would come in and out of my life, but mostly I had no parents. So I panhandled on the street for money to eat, stole food from the Dominics and the Jewels. And I knew one thing, I had to go to Fenwick. Fenwick was where there was hope and opportunity. My grandmother had been a, uh, what, was, what was now probably called uh, uh, a secretary, it was called a registrar then. Uh, she had retired, but before she did, I got a chance to come here a couple times during the summer when she would work here and walk the halls. And I saw all the pictures and the trophy cases and heard the stories about the people that went here and the types of lives that they had after they left. And the pictures seemed to have this kind of mysticism to them of like, and I saw words like tradition, excellence, and discipline, which were things that I didn't have in my life at that time. <clears throat> so I took the entrance exam. I forged my mother's signature on all of the financial aid paperwork and got accepted. And I started going to Fenwick High School with no parents. And I worked at Giovanni's Pizzeria on Roosevelt as a busboy, and I'd work there until about 1 or 2 in the morning, get off of work, show up for weights at the Fenwick pressing team at 5.30 or 6, do weights, answer the phones as part of my financial aid package uh, right before school, at my lunch, after school, and then when I was done working in the business affairs office, I would then go and wrestle. And I did that until November when I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't, it just, I wasn't eating, I was, which was great if you're a wrestler, but like not eating even when I could. And uh, so I told one of the uh, counselors, I was just like, today when the bell rang and everyone went into class, I just couldn't do it another day. So I was alone in the hall and I said, I gotta talk to somebody. So I went to talk to a counselor and I said, I have an idea. Is it cool if I sleep in the old rectory? And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, I work till 2 in the morning. If I can come to school, it cuts out, it just lets me sleep for about an extra hour. So I'd like to sleep up in the old bell tower, basically, in the old rectory, if that's cool. And then I could just get up, go to wrestling, answer the phones, cut out the middle. And he's like, well, what would your parents say about that? And I'm like, well, actually, I don't have any parents. And so I did become a ward of the state. I didn't go into an orphanage. I wound up moving with my aunt and uncle for the rest of high school. We lived in Riverside, then back to Berwyn, then Forest Park. And uh, throughout that, I had to pull back from wrestling. Fenwick um, saved my life. That's why I'm here today to pay back this beautiful thing that was, was given to me. The tradition of being a part of this thing is wonderful. You probably experience it a little bit. So much more when you leave here and you see the wonderful gifts. Some that you probably thought like I did, not really understanding what was being given to me, that I use now at 42 years old, I'll be 43 in April, which is probably a million years old to everyone in this room, but I use the same type of tenacity and discipline and an approach to tradition tradition and excellence right now, 25 years later. So it's a beautiful thing. So that's why I'm here. I'm also here to tell you about the career that I've gone into, which might help you who said you were an actress, but anybody else here that might be thinking of going into creative fields. Since um, graduating Fenwick, I was going to go into the Marine Corps because I had no money and no money for college. And I would slip some writing to a teacher that's no longer here named Dr. Plobelis. 
and he shared it with, who's my English teacher, he shared it with Mr. Borsch. And Mr. Borsch wound up getting me a scholarship to three, four colleges actually, based on that writing package through a thing called the Golden Apple Scholarship. And I actually wound up teaching seniors creative writing two weeks after I graduated at DuSable and then Terrell Grade School, which is uh, on the south side by like 51st in the state. College wasn't for me. I went for one year, it just it wasn't for me. And so I started taking classes at Second City, Improv Olympic, learning improv, and started building up a performance foundation for what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be an actor, a director, a producer, something in the creative field. So I started getting a little notoriety in Chicago as a comedian, and on September 11th, I watched the second plane fly into the second tower, and I had a moment of clarity. I'm Irish and Puerto Rican. I was raised by immigrants who moved here for the American dream, and I realized I'm playing it safe. I had a Fenwick education. I have ambition. I have some skills. And at that time, I had a great city job. I was actually plowing the runways at O'Hare, a city worker, making $27.50 an hour, which is great money, with a pension. I could have started a family. I could have sent those kids to, right here to Fenwick. But I wanted something more, not because I'm selfish or delusional, just something in me wanted, something more. And so I went to the airport and I said, I'd like to resign from this job. And they said, first the world was coming to an end, they were grounding all the planes. It was total chaos and they said, why would you leave? You have the best job in the city. You have the best city job that there is, why would you give that up? And I said, I have to go to California to pursue this career of going into show business. And they said, do you know anybody in California? Like, do you know? Do you have a job waiting for you? I'm like, I literally know no one. And they said, well, just take a leave of absence. That way, if it doesn't work out for you, which it won't, and the lady said that, when you come back, you'll have a job waiting for you. And I said, if I have the job waiting for me here, then I've never left. I can't have the safety net. I must go and really go for it, or else I haven't gone for it. So I left that job. I was married at the time. My uh, mother and father-in-law just could not understand what it was that I was doing, taking their daughter across the country into a career with almost 99% fail rate. And so I left. And since moving out there, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, and I also want to open the floor to questions, I've um, written and produced 14 network and cable television shows. I've written and produced um, for four Academy, five Academy Award winning directors and six Academy Award winning writers, multiple Emmy winners, have sold three uh, TV shows to network, have three on board, a memoir is coming out next year. The last movie I acted in was, I played Josh Brolin's partner in Gangster Squad, and uh, I'm 160 episodes into a podcast that's available in 38 countries. So I've gotten all of that now. I have one year of college, and to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you one thing I learned in that, that year of college. I'm not saying that college isn't an amazing experience. It just wasn't for me. But I can tell you a thousand memories of Fenwick. A thousand. And the things that I brought with me were tradition, excellence, and discipline. I don't, my mother robbed Forest Park Federal Bank. I don't come from a pedigree. I don't come from a family legacy of success. I don't come from people that have the answer really to living. We can survive really well. I knew how to survive for a long t part of my life. But living was another story. I did not know how to live life on life's terms. But not having a pedigree, not having a leg legacy, not having somebody opening doors for me. Here's what I learned at Fenwick. Work. Work. Now this doesn't necessarily relate to a creative field. It can relate to any field. While you're dreaming about your dreams, I'm working. While you're telling your friends about what you're going to do, I'm doing it. While you're talking, I'm working. And anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. So while other people may have had other opportunities that I didn't have, work is the great equalizer. And what I learned at Fenwick is I can outwork anybody. I'll just outwork you. I will just outwork you. So I started to watch. I'm a student of the human condition. At first, just to survive, just to get by. Are you a friend or are you a foe? I grew up in a very violent house. When I come home, are you going to hit me or are you going to hug me? I need to know things about you right away. So I'm a student of the human condition, right? That's what I do. I write. I write stories. Well, how do I translate that into a work ethic? 
I must find the hardest working person I know and say, what do you do? How did you do it? A, a beginner's mind. Maintain a beginner's mind. Always be a student. When I'm the expert on something, my growth stops. It just stops. There's nowhere to go. If I know everything, how do I learn? How do I grow? How do I increase in the joy in my life with what it is that I'm doing? That's when you're going to see people who are really unhappy. How many people in here have a relative or know somebody that thinks they know everything? Raise your hand. How happy are they? They're miserable and they know everything. How does that work? How can you be miserable and know everything? It's because your experience with life has stopped. You've hit the wall. There's no growth. You're not experiencing anything new. So I committed myself to hustle. Not on the negative street term, but hustle, hustle, hustle. Create opportunities. Find ways to win. Legitimately, with ethics, honorably, with tradition, ex excellence, and discipline. You can do all of it. There are no shortcuts. There are no hustles, right? You can, you can, the lazy person must work twice as hard. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to cut a corner, and then you're going to have to do it again. And while you go back to finish what you could have done one time through, the person that you're competing with is now ahead of you because they just did it right the first time. Now, if someone sat across from me when I was your age and told me this, I would have gone in one ear and out the other. Possibly. I don't know. So I tell you this with all the sincerity. Take my pain, take the hard work that I've earned, and take it to the bank. Because it saved my life, and it's now given me an opportunity in a life beyond my wildest dreams. And... Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions, or Gene, if you have any insights of, of uh, anything. But first, I want to open up if anybody has any questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. Do you know Jerry or Tony Poro? No. Chicago guys? No. Wrestling coaches. Here. Oh, Rafino. No, um, no. Poro's. Um, oh, the new one. I actually wrestled for Coach Rafino, who actually works here now in a... Um, Maintenance. So, yeah, facilities. he's a facilitating yeah. manager, yeah. I wrestled for him at Morton on Junior Falcons in grade school, and then it was Coach Udera and then Coach Gaddy, and then Rufino took over after I graduated, but I haven't had a chance to meet the new coach. Do you wrestle? Yeah. It's a great sport. Wrestling saved my life. Wrestling is fun. Have you ever run stairs? Oh, with, the, with the guy on my, who's the weight beneath me on my back. Fire. Yeah, here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, it was... If I didn't have a place to burn off anger and frustration that I didn't even know I possessed, which was what wrestling did for me, you guys would be visiting me in prison. That's just my story. I just didn't have capacity to wrestling and the ability to, to work that hard here at Fenwick saved my life. Great question. Did you have a question? Um, no, no. He was asking the same question. Oh, okay. Anybody else have one? Yes. When you went to California then, did you set up an apartment straight away or whatever? And where, whose who's door did you, where did you start knocking on doors? And what were you asking when you knocked on those doors? Did you know what you wanted other than a life in showbiz? Did you have some clue or not really? Well, I wanted to be a comedian. Okay. And then I thought by being a comedian, I would attain some amount of fame and with fame would come power and then I could write. Because I thought that was that would be my path to writing. I didn't think you could just write. I didn't, I didn't know any writers, but I did know comedians. I knew no writers. Because I would be out at Second City, I'd see fellow improvisers, or I'd be performing, with, and I'd see another comedian, but I knew no writers. And so I was so naive when I left O'Hare to fly to um, LAX, I literally figured that everybody in first class must be in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. Because who else would fly first class out to Los Angeles? So I just started shaking everyone's hand, like, uh, your professor has told you of making the first impressions. Hi, my name is Mick Bencourt. I am an actor and a comedian. If you have any room in any of your projects, films, or TV shows, I'm sitting in seat 22A. And they're like, uh, okay. Like, none of them were in the entertainment business. They were just rich people flying in LA. And this lunatic guy was like, hey, put me in your TV show. I'm like, okay, I don't have a TV show, but I'll keep that in mind. Like, that's the level that I was at of knowing nobody. And so when I got out there, I rented a Kia. It was the cheapest car I could find. It was $99 for the month, unlimited miles, and it was insured. There was a kid that went to Fenwick that lived out there that was in the insurance business. He lived in Santa Monica, and I knew him from grade school. So I lived on his sofa Monday through Friday, and then Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, I slept in the car for six months. Or if I could find another person from Chicago, I would crash on their sofa. 
That was the first six months until I found an apartment, and then I did. It said there's a there's an adage about Los Angeles that says it takes a year for you to learn Los Angeles, and then another year for Los Angeles to learn about you. So it's about a two year curve of learning the entertainment business. Everything okay? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I got my first actual entertainment business job on a show. I don't know if anybody knows that. So Raven, the TV show. So my wife was in a travel agency. She worked with a woman who knew a guy from Chicago, the north, from on the north side, that had just gotten out of prison for selling ecstasy at a rave in Arizona. Who was an actor that lives in Los Angeles. So I thought, well, this is the only connection I have. I have to talk to this guy and see if he knows anything about becoming an actor. So I go to his apartment, which is about a quarter of the size of this room. Bathroom, kitchen, bed, all in the same time. He had just got out of prison for selling ecstasy from Chicago. So I'm like, so how is it going out here? You know, are you working as an actor? He's like, I just got out of prison. I'm in this great church. I'm a born-again Christian. I'd like you to come to my church and really get you in the middle of everything. And I said, well, that sounds amazing, but I'd like to talk to you about acting. If I could, let me hear about your church in about 30 minutes after you explain how Los Angeles works. And while we're talking, and he's saying, I'm having a hard time getting an agent. You have to get an agent in order to get work, but you can't have an agent unless you're working, and it's this weird business puzzle that you have to figure out. His phone rings. And the phone call was That's So Raven, the TV show, looking for a guy named Raven, R-A-V-I-N, as in I'm Raven party guy. Raven was Brian's friend, who was a production assistant on That's So Raven. So Raven worked for That's So Raven. Raven put Brian's name down as an emergency contact when he got the job. They called and they said, have you seen Raven? But he hasn't been here for three days. And Brian said, no, no. They said, well, we need a production assistant. Do you want to be it? And he goes, no, 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 but hold on. He goes, dang. Do you want to be a production assistant for That's So Raven? And I go, what is that? What do you do? And he goes, I got a guy standing in front of me. He's been a production assistant for three years. <laughs> I got offered to be a line producer in training and in one year would have made six figures, around $100,000, which was life-changing money. And I said no, because it's not what I want. I moved out. I'm a creative person. I want to do something creatively. I could have stayed with the city of Chicago if this was just about money but I want to do something creative. I paid a price for that for about two years of abject poverty where <clears throat> my wife got pregnant, we had a son, and there was no money, bankruptcy, all of the credit cards cashed out. I was working at Starbucks. She was working at the front desk of a hotel in Santa Monica. She was eating at the cafeteria, and I was eating the broken down muffins that we could have written down because that was the only way we could afford baby formula for our son. So it got rough, and it was rough for a long time. And now my mind started playing tricks on me like, it's one thing if you have a dream. It's one thing if your wife wants to support your dream. But now there's a child involved. And so now I'm putting my son through traumatic experiences, even though he's a little baby, because I have a dream. How selfish am I being? So I reached out to a guy who uh, co-created a TV show that I had booked as an actor which paid like six grand, it was a TV pilot. So networks will make a pilot. If they don't like it, they won't order it to series. And that was the story with this particular show. And I called him up, his name's Vincent No. He wrote a movie called Hancock, if you've ever seen uh, Hancock. He wrote that. So I said, Vince, I have an idea for a TV show. I'm in dire straits here. I don't want anything from you. I know you're a powerful guy. I'm not asking you for anything other than to listen to this idea and tell me because I have such a limited time here as a dad and the ships are sinking whether I should commit my time to this. I met with him. I told him the idea for the show. He said, I'll go out with you on that. And I go, I don't, I don't even know what that means. He said, well, we'll pitch it together. We'll take it into the production company that I have a deal with. If they like it, we'll go into Paramount, which is a studio. And if they like it, we'll go in and we'll pitch it to CBS which is the network. And I said, I'm on it. But I don't have any experience in this, so I'm going to lean on you. Again, I don't want to profess that I know something when I don't, because then I won't learn. I would have missed an entire learning opportunity by pretending to know something that I didn't. I was very honest about what I could do, but promised to him nothing but 110% of my best work, my ambition and my best work. You have my best work, but I don't know everything here. 
I'm new to this, but I can give you my word that I will work very ambitiously for you. So we said, great, let's do it. We came up with a pitch document, which is seven, eight pages, which says why we should write the story, the characters, the world, and what you can expect to see week in and week out as a television series. The morning of the show. Now, here's the wild part. When you go in and pitch a network, and we were dirt poor at the time, they want to know how much, they negotiate the amount first before you go in and pitch it because they don't want to be excited and then have to negotiate. So the number we negotiated was $137,000 is what they would pay us to write the pilot script, which now I'm at a crossroads. I can use that number as we're struggling financially to cripple me with fear and steal my dreams, or I can accept that those are the stakes and lean into it. And I decided to accept those are the stakes. If this opportunity is supposed to happen, I just need to work toward it, and I'm just catching up to what's supposed to already happen. So the morning I wake up, I'm excited. I kiss my wife. She wishes me well. I walk down. We're in a tiny apartment in Van Nuys. I get in our 94 Chevy Cavalier covered in rust with one hubcap, the car we had in Chicago, that we shipped out on a rail because it wouldn't have even made the drive from Chicago to California. I turn the key. There's no gas. I go back upstairs. She has no money. The bankruptcy, everything. All the coins in the sofas, gone. Everything's gone. Here I am on the one yard line, ready to make this opportunity happen, and I can't even get to the opportunity. I can't even arrive to the life changing moment. We tip over this file cabinet. She said, I think there was one card that we had that we didn't activate before that I was saving for an emergency. We tip everything over, and a card falls out between two files in this file cabinet. I call the 800 number. And the woman, she said, read me the card number again. And I read it, and she said, we sent that card out like two years ago. You have, I can't activate that card. I said, I'm going to a job interview, and I only need $20 for gas. That's it. Can you just give me $20? And she said, fine, $20, and that's it. I get $20 for the card. I race down the street. I put $20 in. I fly over the hill, 30-minute drive. I run in. I'm five minutes late. I'm covered in sweat. I sit down. We each pitch out. Everything seems to go well. President of CBS is there. We walk out, we're by the elevators, and I said, how do, you th how do you think that went? And one of the producers said, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to duck back in there and ask her. She goes back in, comes back out five minutes later and says, congratulations. And I go, did they like it? And he goes, they bought it. And that's when my knees wobbled a little bit. I chewed the inside of my cheek because I didn't want to start crying in front of all these people. And then that's where you just kind of act like you've been there before. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful news. Wonderful news. Really looking forward to what's coming next in this project here. I had no idea what you even say in a moment like that. So just like looking forward to how we're going to collaborate moving forward. That's not official. Mm -hmm. So we sold that show. That money got divided in half. And that was my first foray into actually writing for drama. Then they decided not to make it. So CBS bought the show, didn't shoot the pilot. It was another year and a half before I got another pilot. That money lasted about four months after we caught up all of the debt that we owed. And then it was another year and a half, and I thought, now here we are, back down into the poverty, wondering whether I'm ever going to make money again, whether it was a fluke, whether it was a one and done type situation. And that's when I got hired on Law and Order SVU. And so since then, I've had been employed on 14 different shows, and uh, hopefully we'll have some show shooting here in Chicago next summer, which will employ anywhere between 200 to 600 people. Any questions? Yes? I know you told us like a while ago, but what did you do at Second City? Second City, I went to the training center, then I went to the conservatory, and then I did a show with Matt Dwyer, who's now in uh, Los Angeles, called the Midnight Bible School, which was a hybrid of stand-up and sketch. Second City was great, and then it went through this really stale period, and then they did a review called Pinata Full of Bees. Like, it was kind of dead. McNapier from Annoyance actually came over and started directing the new shows there and really brought it back to life. So Pinata Full of Bees started selling out, adding shows, and so people, they didn't want to turn the business down. So Dwyer started a show in uh, Donnie Skybox. I don't know if that theater's still there. Mm -hmm. So in Donnie Skybox, called the Midnight Bible School, which started at midnight because they, would, they added an extra Second City show, but then we moved it down to 10, which was great because we got the spill off from all of the overage
because the pinata full of bees were that saved that made that show. But I'm really proud of the work that we did there. From that show was um, people that did that show were Zach Alfanakis, T.J. Miller, Kumail Nanjiani, both who are on Silicon Valley right now, um, Eric Acosta and Ryan Ridley, both who write for Rick and Morty, uh, John Roy, who's doing a show with James Adomian on FX, an animated show. Like it was amazing the group of people that came out of there. You're at Second City, right? Yeah. It's phenomenal. Yeah, it's great work. Great work. Second City and, and Fenwick are probably the two most influential places that I've been to. Second City because um, I keep this with me at all times, but I can have, um, you've done improv in the class, right? A little bit. Yeah. So I don't need a, a, a set idea to begin writing. I can just take a color or a look or a nuance and put it down in the book and build a story or a script around that. And uh, I just want to say this because this is part of improv, but um, and I've been saying it all day, please fail magnificently if I can share anything with all of you here is to fail magnificently. Failure is the cover charge for success. Failure is the foundation that you will build your dream life on. If you protect yourself from failing or from feeling fear or from being uncomfortable, you're literally stopping your own progress. Now, those are defensive mechanisms that your body have. Like doing improv or acting defies the natural human instinct to go up and feel vulnerable. Nobody here wants to feel vulnerable. So the transition from sitting in a chair and standing up in the middle of the room defies your natural instinct to be part of the herd and comfortable. But if you can get out of your comfort zone, you hear that cheesy term all the time, but if you can actually do that and embrace failure and embrace feeling uncomfortable, then all you're going to have is progress. All you're going to start to do is experience things that you've never experienced before. Because if you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done before to get it. Do the same thing, get the same thing. Do the same thing, get the same thing. So if you're getting frustrated, if you feel like you've stalled out, ask yourself what it is that you're doing. Allow yourself to be uncomfortable. And if it's new, let it feel inauthentic. It shouldn't. It's new to you. Let it not feel right. Allow yourself to be afraid and be uncomfortable through the entire process and then grow and lean into it. And that's how you're going to experience everything, particularly success. Do you, um, so now you've, so now you've achieved a certain level of success, but you, you said it yourself, so maybe I'm answering the question already. Um, are you still having to actively um, promote your writing and so forth? Are, Absolutely. Are, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm going out to give you an idea. So I'm pitching three shows. Um, one's called War that I've co-created with my cousin who's a lieutenant colonel in the uh, Army. He's an Army Ranger. And it's going to be the first show in the history of television that's co-created by a high-ranking member, an active high-ranking member of the military. So that's one show. Another show that I created is called, now that's just a pitch. We just came up with that seven to nine page document that I told you about. We just wrote that up. So now we have to go to production companies, then we go to studios, then we try to sell it. I wrote on spec, which means I did it for free, a pilot, the first episode, of a show called Proud of a Son, which is based on my freshman year here at Fenwick with no parents while working with, um, let's use the word, Chicago outfit members <laughs> at, at night. So, you know, I got this street education at night, and then I would come here at Fenwick and I'd wrestle. And I learned about tradition, excellence, and discipline, and how those two worlds uh, conflicted with each other. So Aaron Paul, who some of you may know from Breaking Bad, he was the younger guy in Breaking Bad, is my producing partner on that. And I'm meeting with John Cheadle, um, who directed a movie called Miles Ahead, that most of you probably know as an actor from the Ocean's Eleven movies. And uh, he's going to come on, hopefully, as the director. And then we'll bring that package in to, this is where the producing side comes in. Outside of me just writing, I have to package all those elements together. And we'll bring that into Netflix or Amazon and hopefully set that up. And then the third show is based on a New York Times article about the New Orleans Public Defender's Office. And so that's going to be more like a law and order SVU type of case of the week thing that I hope to set up at Netflix with the, if anybody's watched the Netflix show Last Chance You, which is about uh, uh, junior college football team in Eastern Mississippi. The director of that is attached to, but I had to go and package all of those things. So as far as the promoting that you're talking about, you have to be ambitious and go out and be proud of your work and then try to put a team together to then go bring in and sell it. Yes, sir. 
there any advice you could give us that like you wish you would have taken? I wish I would have been kinder to myself. I don't know if anybody else puts a lot of pressure on themselves for what they're doing or what their goals are, but I wish I was a lot kinder to myself. There's a thing called uh, a negative cognitive schema. Does anybody know what that is? Negative cognitive schema? Star Trek? No? Okay. Um, what a neg negative cognitive schema is this. I suck at math. I'm the worst at math. Right? I don't know if anybody experiences that. You keep telling yourself a negative story over and over and over again in your head. Maybe I had a bad math test. Maybe a teacher was having a bad day and did make an inappropriate comment out of frustration. And I take that one morsel, I let it burrow in my head, and I just water it every day. And I start creating a false narrative for myself over and over and over again, telling myself based on no fact what I can and cannot do with my life. So I am deciding on my own behalf and cutting my dreams in half. Now, I was very hard on myself and very negative for a long period of time. I didn't know what a negative cognitive scheme is. I didn't know how powerful that negative self-talk actually could be. And it directly contradicted with my faith, which we learn here at Fenwick. How can I have faith and be so cruel to myself at the same time? So learning that actually wound up increasing my faith. God either is or he isn't. Very simple for me. I don't need to figure that out. I don't, you know, this is the, the riddle of the human existence and experience since man crawled out of the cave. So when I took the pressure off myself of deciding who or what God is, and I just let God be and have faith, then all of the negativity started to fall by the wayside because I got my strength from that rather than trying to regenerate it every day. That's my long answer to your very short question. <laughs> yes. Who are some like the coolest, like famous people that you met or like came across? Um, Ice T was pretty cool. Um, I worked with Ice T for three years on um, on um, Law and Order SVU. Super great, multi-talented musician, director, actor, <coughs> documentary filmmaker. Art Rob was great. Uh, Chris Maloney and uh, Mershka Hargitay were great. Sinai Latham was great. I just worked with her on Shots Fired. I got a chance to work with Helen Hunt and Richard Dreyfus. And growing up, like watching Richard Dreyfus films like Jaws and uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, being a guy that panhandled uh, for food, and then to be on a set with Richard Dreyfus sitting next to me and lean over and go, "Was well, that what you were thinking when you wrote that?" I can't even explain to you the profound, the profundity of that moment of like. How, how did this happen? How is Richard Dreyfus? I don't even know how many Academy Awards he's won, asking me if, if, if he's doing a good job. And I got a chance to walk through that with a humility here that I learned in Fenwick, which again just goes back to the work. If it's about me, this is just my own experience, I'm, I'm doomed as being a little dramatic, but I'm in big trouble if I'm making it all about me. And, then, and surely in Hollywood, there's a very egotistical place, and, and that works for a lot of people. For me, it's a real liability. Like, I had to figure out how can I be of service? That's how I approach my creativity and my business. How can I be of service to this moment, to this person? So it was just so great. Ice-T was great. Um, Dominic Lombardozzi, I don't know if you know him, if anyone saw Bronx Tale, but he was Herc on a show called The Wire. I don't know if anybody watched The Wire. Um, and he's now on a show called Rosewood, which is on Fox. He's the bald guy, but he's like a Bronx guy. He's a real blue collar, kind of knucklehead. Never went to acting school, never took a class a day in his life. He was playing stickball when they were making a Bronx tale. And they said, hey, do you want to be in a movie? And he's like, okay. <laughs> and he showed up, and he was in the movie, and he loved it so much. I think his, his brother's doing a, a serious case for possibly a homicide, and he used that as his way out. He used his art as a weapon to carve his own life. Great people. You'll meet some phenomenal people. Really great.